Good morning, everybody. My name is Sharon Rich. I'm the Senior Trust Advisor for AGID, where we manage special needs trust to help seniors and persons with disabilities qualify for Medicaid benefits when they're over the income or the asset limit. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, where we're going to talk about IRAs and special needs trust. Our program today has been approved for continuing ed credits for guardians, attorneys, certified senior advisors, and you will receive an email from Kate at trustagent.org within about a week of today's program that will have a certificate of attendance for you and a copy of the presentation and the recording. We have a large audience today, so I would appreciate everybody putting their questions into chat, and we'll leave uh, five or 10 minutes at the end to answer everybody's questions. I am really excited today about our speaker, Peter Wall. I've known Peter for several years now. He is the um, chief fiduciary um, uh, advisor at TrueLink Financial Advisors. Peter has a 20 years of professional trust administration with a focus in elder law and special needs planning. Uh, he has lots of credentials um, and uh, he is just a wealth of knowledge. And so I'm gonna let Peter uh, take it away now. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sharon. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, as Sharon said, yeah, pop any, um, questions or you know anything that you may have uh, in the chat and I'll do my very best to uh, to get to them. A little bit about myself um, as Sharon uh, you mentioned I, I lead the investment management arm of, uh, of of Truling Financial prior to that um, as Sharon said, spent a lot of time doing trust administration so. mostly focused in the uh, special needs trust and elder law arena. Um, so I get to visit your state at least once a year, which is wonderful. I'm in Denver uh, but uh, you know, since 2016, have been um, you know on the faculty and planning staff there at uh, at Stetson. So uh, always a fantastic conference, and I hope to see um, all of you there again this year. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit today about the Secure Act, Secure Act 2.0, um, and everything that kind of flipped planning on its head, quite frankly, in a very beneficial way for people with disabilities, but. It's a fantastic opportunity for, you know, the attorneys, estate planners, uh, drafters, you know, to, to reach back out to their clients and just make sense, uh, or excuse me, just, just make sure that the plan that you have in place um, just makes sense. So I learn by repetition, right? So, I, you know, I, I teach, you know, at, 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 uh, at uh, national conferences all over the country, and I still come away from even some of the most basic sessions with like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that part, or um, you know, learned a little little something new. So we're going to start a little basic um, this morning, that being said, and just talk about what an IRA is, okay? So an IRA, right, is a tax-deferred vehicle, and the I in IRA is going to be really, really important um, in our discussions today. We're mostly going to focus on inherited IRAs, but the I in IRA stands for individual, Okay, so there's no such thing as a trust owned IRA. A trust isn't a person, it cannot own an IRA, but it can be the beneficiary of an IRA, right? And you can see here the total contribution amount across all retirement accounts for a family, well, married filing jointly, for example, 22.5. That, that, that's going to be increasing here, and, and I'll show you where. Um, we're not really going to go into Roth IRAs, although a lot of the new rules do apply. Um, we're not going to talk about SEPs or SIMPLES or anything like that. Now, there are, uh, you know, generally people put money into a 401k uh, or an IRA or they roll over, and we'll talk about that here in a second, too, their 401k to an IRA when they leave that employer. You can touch the money in an IRA before the age of 59 and a half, but there's a 10% federal tax penalty. And there are exceptions that are listed there. I'm not the kind of presenter that y'all can read. I'm not going to go through every bullet line. Um, but uh, it's important to note that any distribution from an IRA uh, inherited, and again, I'm just speaking about traditional, right? Traditional inherited IRAs or, you know, just tr traditional IRAs, any withdrawal is still taxed as income, okay? So you're allowed to put money away 
you know, pre-tax money away into an IRA or a 401k, and that's not taxable um, then to you in the year that you deposit it. But the, the IRS is clever, right? They want their money eventually. So if the, the monies in an IRA are allowed to grow tax deferred until you take them out. And that's when you, when you take those monies out, that's when it's taxed as income on your personal 1040. Or in the case of a trust, right, it's taxed on the trust's 1041. Um, I always do this. I always get ahead of myself in the presentation. So here you can see here, I already really talked about contributions. Um, you can see here, though, that starting next year, uh, the catch-up contributions for ages 60 to 63 for the SECURE Act 2.0 really jump up. So if savers haven't been putting enough money away for their retirement, the government is incentivizing them to put more away at ages 60 to 63, um, up to $10,000 to a workplace plan. And that's important to note. And it is indexed um, for inflation after 2025. Um, a rollover IRA, we already talked about this, but this is where you take monies from your 401k or your employee sponsored plan and you, you, you change jobs. You can, you can leave it there. You certainly can. But to make things easier, a lot of people just, you know, roll it over to uh, an IRA. There's no tax penalty for doing so. However, you'll get a little pushback sometimes, especially from the larger wirehouses, right? The larger investment advisors and, and things like that. Um, to withhold from your um, from your IRA for, or excuse me from your 401k or if you're transferring an IRA to an IRA and this happens a lot with inherited IRAs right the original IRA owner passes away then you know as trustee um, personal representative executor of the estate you'll go to XYZ custodian slash investment advisor and say hey I need to roll this over into an inherited IRA FBO for, excuse me for the benefit of the special needs trust or trust or things like that. And I think it's part of their checklist. And they say, hey, great. Do you want to withhold any taxes? And generally, guys, the answer should be no. No, I don't want to because it's not a taxable event. So why would you withhold um, any funds, right? So this is called a custodian to custodian transfer, sometimes known as a direct rollover. And basically what you're telling the transferring institution is, hey, this is moving from one tax deferred vehicle to another tax deferred vehicle. The money is never touching the beneficiary's hands, right? Which is also important for public benefits, means-tested public benefits qualification. It's just going from, let's say, Fidelity to Schwab, for example. There's no reason really to withhold taxes from that. And it's important to note that if you do, you're still on the hook to deposit the full amount in the um, in the new uh, role, the, the IRA in which you roll over, you're rolling over the funds to. Let me take a step back. Let's say it's a $10,000 IRA. You elect to withhold 20%. So $8,000 goes over from Fidelity to Schwab in this particular example. But the IRS says, hey, no, you have to have the full 10,000 over there within 60 days, but you're going to get that $20,000 back, right? Or 2,000, I, I can't remember. I <laughs> use as the example, the withheld amount, the 20%, you have to still deposit it over there. At the, at the new institution, but you're not gonna get that money back until you file your tax return and those federal taxes that have been withheld or potentially state taxes are then refunded to you. So not usually a great idea is, is my point here to, to withhold taxes from a direct transfer, direct rollover custodian to custodian. Um, when you, you have, you can also, your beneficiaries can also take the monies or whatever personally, and then they have 60 days to establish a new account. Um, and that's where that's where really, you know, you, you get into a lot of trouble. You can get, you know, then if they don't open a new account within 60 days, then it's a full taxable transfer. You know, there can be a lot of issues. So we have a question here. What happens to a 403B once you stop working at the 401C3? Do you have to roll that over to another type of account? I don't believe so, Christina, but we're just going to be focusing on really traditional IRAs and inherited IRAs and uh, special needs trust today. That's a fantastic question for your own personal tax advisor, or there's probably a ton of literature out there uh, uh, from your plan provider. I, I just, I honestly don't know the answer. If I had to make an educated guess, I would say probably not, but uh, definitely don't take my word for it. Okay. So a lot of times as planners, PR, uh, 
PR personal representative, executor of the estate, et cetera, et cetera, you're like, well, I don't really know what this asset is. And so here are some typical inherited IRA retitling formats that most of the large wire houses use. Okay, so you see, here's the original account owner, right? Usually we'll say deceased or DEC or something like that, IRA, FBO, which means again, for the benefit of John Joe Jr. or the trustee or you know things like that. And so just a heads up that when you're marshalling assets and you're looking, uh, you, you know, you're looking at, hey, what the heck do I have on my hands here? This is usually a pretty good um, indicator. Of note, when you inherit that IRA, we're going to talk about this. You, you have to start taking RMDs or required minimum distributions. So the minimum amount that the I, IRS says you have to take out of this account. So they start getting paid on the income taxes, right? Uh, by December 31st of the year following the account owner's death. Sounds like you've got plenty of time, right? Because, you know, layperson and individual trustees, they always are, are right on top of due dates and letting you know as the corporate trustee or the professional fiduciary, hey, mom died, you know, this year. At, come on, I'm being, I'm being a little sarcastic, right? It sounds like you have a lot of time, but you really don't, okay? So the quicker you can get your hands around the assets, the quicker you can marshal those assets. And a lot of times I understand that's completely out of your control. But there is exceptions, right? If you don't file, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. If you don't get the RMD by December 31st of the year following the account owner's death, um, there are some remedies to fix that that we'll talk about it here in a second. Okay, so fa uh, rewind, I guess, go back in time to the end of 2019. And as planners and professionals in this community, nobody saw the SECURE Act coming. And, um, you know, unless you were very involved, uh, you know, with the, uh, the subcommittees in Congress and things like that. But all of a sudden, you know, at the end of 2019, everybody woke up and here's the brand new Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement Act or the SECURE Act. Um, there are a lot of great features to this, a lot of, you know, sort of not great features um, to this. And of course, and this happens, um, you can't get everything right, especially when you know, Congress, uh, you know, passes bills that are, you know, this much, you know, this lengthy in, uh, in total, uh, you know, verbiage and, and, you know, all kinds of special interest stuff stuck in there. So they got some stuff wrong. All good that, you know, thanks to a lot of efforts by the Special Needs Alliance, by NALA, um, a lot of special, you know, a, a lot of special needs trust groups. Um, we, you know, got some language clarified that, that definitely needed to be addressed. Um, at during after the passage of the Secure Act 2.0, which as you can see here was passed at the end of 2022. Now a lot of people, you know, will say it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, but a lot of people will say, does Congress actually, uh, you know, do anything? Do they, are they are they actually up there uh, enacting any legislation? Well, I can tell you one thing: they're really good at acronyms, or they take their acronyms very seriously. So you can see here that part of the um, Securing a Strong Retirement Act of 2022 include the, the Rise and Shine Act and the Earn Act and you know things of this nature. But um, here's basically what it did, guys. Um, the Secure Act, you know, uh, basically eliminated the required minimum distribution stretch for many beneficiaries. Um, what this used to mean is if my dad passed away and left me his IRA prior to the SECURE Act being passed, I could generally take the required minimum distributions out over my lifetime. And that's a great benefit for me, right? Uh, as the inheritor, because I can leave those assets in the IRA account to grow, because uh, generally capital gains are not taxed in an IRA. Um, and, and I could really you know, stretch that tax deferred benefit out you know, for a really long time. Well, now that's gone. and. You know, uh, there are exceptions to the rule, but generally most people who aren't a spouse or person with a disability, we're, we're going to go over all of that, now have to take that out over the next 10 years, right? It's a real benefit to the IRS because they get their income tax uh, much quicker um, for those particular beneficiaries. Um, but, you know, it, it, there are some benefits, especially for people with disabilities, which is really going to be the focus today. We also have new required minimum distribution um, dates. So uh, at, you, you know now we can now we can you know put off taking required minimum distributions until age seventy two. Um, now set, under Secure Act under Secure Act two then seventy three, and you can 
see that it jumps up to 75 there in 2033. And, and, and both acts apply to any IRA inherited um, after January 1st, 2020. So that's important to note as well. So then when the SECURE Act 2.0 passed um, in December 22, uh, there were approximately 90 new provisions added to the SECURE Act, each with its own effective date. So um, you don't have to read them all. I did it for you and sort of sum summarized what I thought were the most salient points here. You can see the catch-up contributions increase. We already you know, talked about that. Student loans, I mean, really interesting um, that an employer can match contributions now. Um, I find this one really interesting, but very limiting, okay? The, this qualified tuition program, QTP, not a QTIP, not a qualified terminal interest property trust, but um, college, basically a college 529 plan, right? So if, so this is the limiting part, if a QTP was maintained for 15 years and the annual limits for the rollover are within annual contribution limits, and there's a lifetime limit of 35,000, now you can roll over a QTP into a Roth IRA. Do I think the, um, the, the limits on here are a little silly? I do, badminton and it's an Olympic sport. So here we are. Uh, you can also see this is kind of new. I haven't seen it been rolled out yet, uh, but there's supposed to be a 401k lost and found database, uh, which sounds really neat. Think of it like your state treasurer's achievement office right, where you can go and find missing money and things like that. This will be really helpful once it's rolled out for PRs and uh, executors to, you know, wrap their arms around a decedent's estate. And there's also this missed RMD penalty reduction, okay? So it used to be, remember how we were talking earlier about if you didn't, you know, grab all those assets and do an RMD by 1231 of the year following the decedent's passing, um, there used to be a 50% penalty on that. Now that's reduced to 25%. That's great. And then it's reduced to 10% if it's rectified by the second year following the year that it was due. There's also this thing, and I, I think it's called a Form 5329. Um, I'm pretty sure, actually, um, that if you miss it, and it's not really your fault, like assets were in transfer, right, between Fidelity and Schwab or the PR, you know, didn't notify us in a timely manner and things like that. You can fill it out and ask for forgiveness. And I've done quite a few of these, um, even before the SECURE Act. Um, was passed and and have never has never been met with any resistance as long as you can properly show hey you know I wasn't doing this to avoid taxation during a higher tax year you know for my benefit or whatever the case may be the IRS is generally pretty lenient with stuff like that okay now we need to figure out hey if I'm a planner if I'm a trustee if I'm a family member I need to make sure that my IRA beneficiary types. Uh, are set up correctly, okay, so that I can take advantage of the potential stretch. And again, what that means, if I wasn't clear before, is that you can stretch the required minimum distributions over the lifetime of the IR inherited IRA beneficiary. That's what we're going to focus on today. So there's three different types of beneficiaries, okay, of an IRA. Let's start with the NDB or the non-designated beneficiary. This is when the IRA account owner goes in there and writes, checks the box for, you know, upon my death, I want everything to go to an estate or I want it to go to a charity. Or if, you know, as a planner, we haven't put together a proper plan. We've, we've done a non-qualified trust and a non-qualified trust is basically any trust where the beneficiaries are not specifically identified in the trust document, okay? This is where problems start to happen. And as planners, we all know that we can create the most beautiful, comprehensive estate plan but if our clients don't properly fill out the IRA beneficiary designation form, it's all for naught. Always remember that any beneficiary designation form, almost always, without a court order, without expenses, you know, uh, incurred to get it fixed, which is, you know, kind of a 50-50 shot anyway, um, they will always supersede a will. They will always supersede a trust. So all of our planning can go right out the window if our clients don't fill out their IRA beneficiary designation forms correct. And here's the problem with an NDB. They check the box that says, I want it to go to my estate thinking, for example, oh, my lawyer said that I have a pour over. So the IRA will just pour over into the, into the estate and then pour over into the, um, so the trust I've set up for my child. Well, that's true. 
but it won't carry the same IRA beneficiary designation. It won't ca carry the same IRA tax deferred status. It'll all come out as cash and it'll all be taxable income. And if we have an NDB, we have five years or if the account owner was over 72 and a half and the required minimum, required minimum distributions then are taking over the decedent's life expectancy because it's about the same as five, okay? Um, this is where some of my favorite IRC language comes from or internal revenue code language comes from where they call this the ghost expectancy rule. Uh, it's a real Scooby-Doo sort of term and then, or the uh, at least as rapidly rule, okay? So this is what we're trying to avoid. Now, if your client wants everything to go to a charity, who cares? We don't care that it you know has to be taken out in five years because that ultimate remainder person being the charity is a non-taxable entity, most likely anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But if we have a non-qualified trust or an estate, we're kind of stuck. The next category of beneficiaries is, is the, you know, the situation I alluded to before, where if my father passes away, leaves me the money instead of, you know, his spouse, uh, excuse me, names me the IRA beneficiary, then we have 10 years uh, to get those, to get all those funds out. Um, and again, not ideal compared to the old rules for me as the inheritor, but um, I, it, it is what it is. And this is the new operating system, which we're using. Now, the, the third type is the most exciting type for those of you who do planning in this in the elder law and special needs trust arena. And this is what's called an EDB or an eligible designated beneficiary. So immediately it's going to be a spouse. So the spouse, you know, those rules haven't changed. OK, can be a beneficiary with a disability. And the IRS defines what a beneficiary with a disability is. It's pretty darn similar to SSI or supplemental security income uh, qualifications. OK. Also, a beneficiary is chronically ill, uh, who is chronically ill would qualify as an EDB. And you can see there, you know, exactly, you know, what that means. Individuals not more than 10 years younger than the decedent. Okay. So basically the IRS is throwing up their arms and going, it's going to be about the same anyway. The IRS is actually probably one of the best actuaries in the world because they see, you know, they have all that data from when, you know, beneficiaries, or excuse me, uh, people are born all the way, you know, until they die. And then of importance here is also any minor children that are inheritors of the IRA, but only during minority. Okay, so we're going to cover this a little bit later, but I'm not, so I'm not going to spoil it. But minor children during minority, um, that can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different states, right? Texas age of majority is different than Colorado, where I'm at, which may be different than Florida, where you all are at. So the IRS defined it um, as age 21 uh, for the purposes of, of this particular section. Okay, the other neat thing is that the SECURE Act also defined an EDB as a special needs trust, okay? And this is your, this is IRC, as you can see, 401A9H4. Um, so, you know, if, if you're a big tax nerd like I am, you can go read that section, but they do note that it has to be a see-through trust, also called a qualified trust. Okay, so what does that mean? Here's the, here are all of the, definitions or that you, your trust needs to, to meet to be able to be called a see-through or a qualified trust. Has to be valid under state law. Pretty easy. Has to be irrevocable. Okay. Now note here that it can be irrevocable upon the passing of the funder, right? So if we, you know, if it's a, te a testamentary trust is basically what I'm trying to say, or in effect after the grantor or settlor, you know, grantor or settlor passes away. Got to provide a copy of the trust to the plan provider and all countable beneficiaries must be identifiable. Okay, remember that in NDBs is when we had a trust where the beneficiaries were not identifiable and all countable beneficiaries must be individuals. And this is where, you know, we had a lot of pushback um, and things from SNA, Special Needs Alliance and NALA and, and through a lot of their fantastic advocacy, we got this changed in Secure Act 2.0 because a lot of folks wanted to be like, let's use AGID as an example. Hey, I want you know to take care of my son, daughter with a disability. I'm going to name Aged, which by their way, their trust is a see-through trust or qualified trust. I want to name Aged as you know the 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 trustee of my child's third party in this particular case. Um, I will talk about the difference between third party and first party and why that makes such a big difference for taxes. I want to name them as the trustee. But then when my beneficiary passes away. Agent has done such a great job 
they're a 501c3. I want them to be the ultimate remainder person um, of the IRA. Before that would have put us back, back into either the five year or 10 year, most likely the five year because of the charity. Okay. And we'll talk about these countable tiers of beneficiaries here in a second. I'm sure you're thrilled. Um, but uh, now, it, you know, even naming aged or NAMI or, you know, whomever um, as the ultimate remainder person does not disqualify the trust uh, as an EDB. So that's really great news. And here's actually where you can see, uh, you know, where the, um, the amendment was made um, to the original Secure Act by the Secure Act 2.0 and the language that was inserted. Um, why are we so focused on the EDB stuff? Well, as disability rights advocates, as advocates for people with disabilities, um, we want to make sure that, you know, beneficiaries are taken care of uh, in a manner that we can make their trust last as long as possible. And an IRA is a fantastic vehicle for doing so because it's tax deferred growth. It lets the assets grow longer, which is which lets the trust last longer and lets those beneficiaries enjoy a better quality of life for more years. And that's that's really kind of what we're all shooting for here. And so again, remember when I said this flipped planning on its um we put planning on its on its head really when we uh, when Secure Act 2.0 and Secure Act came out because generally we were recommending um, you know hey leave inherited IRA assets to the person without a disability because you know and we'll talk about the tax implications and why um, here in a second I don't want to get ahead of myself but like now maybe it does make sense to leave those you know qualified plans um, to a uh, to a to a special needs trust, okay? So there's a couple of different things and here's where we get into the taxation um, where we talk about, okay, is this EDB, the special needs trust, you'll hear the terms conduit trust and accumulation trust, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what that means. A conduit trust basically makes, there is no discretion on the part of the trustee without going to court or something like that, but the trustee has to distribute any income received. So any distribution from the IRA, they have to distribute all of those funds directly to the beneficiary, right? Problems, right? Big problems for beneficiaries on means-tested public benefits. If you receive an, I, uh, an RMD of $10,000 and it conduits directly from the trust to the beneficiary, we have, we have a potential income problem for that beneficiary's means-tested public benefits, and we have a potential resource problem. They don't spend it by the end of the month, things of that nature. Most likely, this kind of trust wouldn't even qualify you know, through Social Security for that beneficiary to receive means-tested public benefits, okay? So nine times out of 10, we're never going to see, we shouldn't probably see a conduit trust uh, for a special needs trust. This is really more advantageous for high net worth folks, right? We are trying to pass out that income to the beneficiary, okay? Why would we ever wanna do that? We would wanna do that because the beneficiary's tax, personal tax rate on that income, because it passes straight through to the beneficiary, right? Conduit, it goes straight through from the trust and then is taxed at the beneficiary level through something called DNI or distributable net income. So. Basically, you know, you spend, you get 10,000 from the uh, RMD, that's taxable, right, to the trust level. And if it stayed there, let's say it's, you know, yeah, let's say it's, let's say it's $16,000. Look at what the trust would pay here on the right side of the slide, right? It would pay 37% on those taxes, excuse me, on that in taxes um, if it stayed in the trust. Okay, we we'll call it trapped income. But in a conduit trust, trustee has no discretion, shoots it out to that beneficiary. Maybe that beneficiary is at a 20% tax bracket, 24% tax bracket, right? So it's advantageous from a tax perspective. That's generally not what we're looking at, right? With special needs trusts and people with disabilities. Most people with disabilities, right? If they're on SSI, recall that SSI is generally not taxable. So you know, they don't real, they're not really paying income tax anyway, they may not even be filing a tax return. So it's really advantageous to push that out to the beneficiary. But if we push it out directly to them through a conduit trust, their means tested public benefits go out the door. And you know, we've done a real disservice to them. And that's why most special needs trusts are accumulation trusts. Okay, this is where the trustee has full discretion over income and principal to say, hey, 
how much you know can the trustee pass out to that beneficiary? Guess what? DNI still applies, which is wonderful. You're just not giving the money directly to the beneficiary. You're doing it via discretionary distributions to or for their benefit. So let's take a step back here. Let's say just to make the math easy for old Pete here, um, we get ten thousand dollars from the RMD, right? We have ten thousand. We have five thousand dollars worth of fees, which are deductible in a third party trust. Okay, not a first party trust. Grantor trusts are no longer uh, after the Tax Cuts and Job Act um, allowed to take. Uh, deductions at the trust level, grantor trusts are not. Third-party trusts can. So let's say $5,000 we have in fees and we have in distributions two or four, most likely four, the benefit of the beneficiary. Great. We have $5,000 in trapped income subject to this schedule here and $5,000 um, to, uh, to the, at the beneficiary level, which may be zero. Okay. This is the difference between um, conduit trust and accumulation trust and a good trustee will be keeping their eye on those distributions to make sure that they're somewhat commensurate with the income that is uh, that is being received. Now, am I saying that trustees should make frivolous dis discretionary distributions just to get around the tax? I'm definitely not saying that. Right. Um, it sometimes it's OK to pay taxes and keep that, you know, keep the money in the trust longer for the benefit of the beneficiary. I hope that made sense. Okay, now we have one more step to figure out how we calculate RMDs and what type of beneficiaries that we're dealing with. So there's three tiers of countable beneficiaries, okay? So again, the three types of beneficiaries, NDB, DB, EDB, but it extends further past just the current beneficiary of the trust, okay? First tier, basically the beneficiary of the trust, okay? Pretty easy. Second tier, anyone who could receive funds after the primary beneficiary, first tier, passes away. Great. Third tier is anyone who is, is anyone after first and second tier, okay? So as we're looking at this, and it, it can get a little complicated to wrap your head around for, for you know, determining the required minimum distribution and what kind of beneficiary we're dealing with, again, NDB, DB, or EDB, here's the takeaway. First, benef first tier beneficiaries always count. Third tier beneficiaries appear to never count. So basically for an accumulation trust or an EDB, we're just looking at those first and second tier beneficiaries. So be really careful as drafters that, you know, as, as you move down, you know, that, you know, the beneficiary or remainder person tree, if you will, that you're keeping everybody as, uh, as DBs uh, and as EDBs uh, so that you can preserve the EDB designation for your first tier beneficiary. Threw a lot of information at you there. Guess what? It's all in the materials and, uh, and I broke it down for you here on this distribution requirement table, okay? Um, okay, how do we figure out um, required minimum distributions? It's not that hard. I'm gonna let you in on a secret. It's really not that hard. So once we figured out, hey, are we dealing with an EDB? Are we dealing with a DB? What are we dealing with here, right? We can see, okay, we basically use the single life expectancy table. See down there at the bottom. I literally just did this for a client, um, looked over their calculations uh, before, uh, before I got on this call. Um, we, you just go to this, this publication and you use the uh, single life expectancy table. It'll give you their life expectancy. You divide the 1231 value of the prior year by that, and that's your required minimum distribution. It's literally that simple. So um, what's difficult is getting there. And I don't know if I have this. No. So I want to take a second and go back here to, to, to give you some insight onto um, some estate planning stuff that we have seen pop up you know, in 23 and early here in 24, where planners thought we, they were doing everything right. And, um, and, and I'll tell you where that, that's probably a mistake. So again, this is just going to serve as a fantastic touch point to get back in front of your clients and say, hey, want to make sure that we've got your estate plan right. Here's what we're, we're seeing a lot of, and this is, this is the biggest problem um, we're, that, that I've seen so far in 24. Now, I understand that we're only into April, 
uh, but uh, this has popped up several times. And there's a creative solution, but it's not ideal. So imagine as a planner, you've set up a plan where you have a revocable living trust, right? For uh, let's say there's only one spouse left and then they want to take all of their uh, funds and divide it between their two kids, okay? But what you've done in the interim, which is not uncommon and was generally a good idea before the SECURE Act is you've set up an administrative trust in between. So you have all these assets titled in this revocable living trust, which is grantor trust for tax purposes, right? And this is why, let's just say mom is still alive, okay? Mom then passes away and you've created what I call an administrative trust, a, a trust in between where, you know, the, um, the, the personal representative, the trustee, uh, the executor, what have you, can then go out and get any assets that aren't titled in the name of the revocable trust, pour them in to this trust, okay, which is now an administrative trust because mom has passed away. And, 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 and then after that, once the estate is settled and everything like that, all the administration of the estate is complete, then the trustee is instructed then, hey, fund these, let's say two special needs trusts for you know, the benefit of, of my kiddos, okay? Here's the problem. On the IRA designation beneficiary form, on the IRA beneficiary designation form, easy for me to say, mom has put the, you know, the XYZ revocable living trust because that's where everything flows into. And, you know, in the past, uh, institutions would probably look through and be like, yeah, we don't really care, you know, get the final trust open. They're not doing that anymore. So they will only pay required minimum distributions. They will only roll over mom's IRA into mom's revocable, which is now irrevocable, okay? Uh, but after she passed away to mom's trust, that's it. That's all they'll do. They will not look through and fund the special needs trust after the fact. They will, you know, they don't want the liability plus your estate planning document and the beneficiary designation form. So they have two things to, to rely on and say, no, it gets paid to this Rev Living Trust and then goes to the special needs trust. We're not going to look through to that. Now, there's some flexibility built into the SECURE Act that as drafters you should look into called the separate accounts rule. OK, so that's a that's a solution to this problem if done before mom's dead. And there's also this thing called the applicable multi beneficiary trust or AMBT, which those rules get complex and we're not going to cover those today. But that's also a solution, too. Here's a third solution when you're stuck. Petition the court. Great. You, you can do that. It's costly. Um, the IRS may say this court doesn't have jurisdiction over us. They got to go all the way up to the federal court. Right. Is that worth it? I don't know. You can ask for a private letter ruling. And this presentation doesn't have a lot of the PLRs that, that um, address IRAs for, for trust. But I will tell you that private letter rulings are extremely specific. They're also extremely costly. So when you're looking at PLRs as guidance, recall that it's specific to that particular situation. And a court may or may not look at your, your particular situation the same. Um, I can tell you that the, especially the larger wirehouse custodians and investment advisors, they won't rely on a PLR because it's not case specific. So here's what you can do. Okay. If you're stuck in this situation, we've done this with some success is keep mom's revocable living trust open. Take those required minimum distributions for the benefit of each special needs trust over the next, you're, you're going to be dealing with a DB now. So you have 10 years, right? So you have a designated beneficiary. So now you can take it over the next five, six, seven, eight, whatever makes most sense from a tax perspective, right? And you'd have to look at distributions from the special needs trust and, you know, things like that to make an educated cost benefit analysis. But anyway, keep mom's revocable living trust open for all the RMDs into there, then pass it on to the kids special needs trust, right? And, and, and you have, you know, DNI that should net to zero, um, in mom's rev trust, but you still have to file a 1041, right? You still have to file a 1041 because the 1099R from the IRA is going to report income to mom's rev trust. So you've got to keep this trust open, which is costly. You have administrative expenses. You have probably trustee fees. You have CPA fees for filing the 1041 and then pass it out. So all of this can be avoided again now if you just go to mom and say, listen, rules have changed. 
don't name your Rev Living Trust uh, of uh, as beneficiary of the IRA, and instead name the kids Ultimate um, Special Needs Trust, and, and all of that is solved. So that was a really long-winded explanation, and hopefully it was somewhat illustrative, but I unfortunately have seen a lot of people caught in this situation. And sometimes it's six to one, half a dozen to the other. Sometimes the analysis comes out and just says, you know what, just take it all um, as income. Uh, it, it depends on the size of the estate and the size of the IRA, and then pass it on to the special needs trust because the cost of preparing tax returns and et cetera, et cetera, outweighs the potential income tax due. Um, but a lot of times it is, hey, we're going to keep this open for two, three, four years and uh, and just sort of deal with it. Okay. Let's get into a, uh, a, a fairly common scenario. So again, y'all can read. So I'm not going to go over this. I'll just address the most important parts. You have parents with twin daughters. One is One has a disability, one does not. Right. So the daughter with the disability, you're going to name aged, for example, as the third party pool special needs trust uh, share share trustee and the daughter without a disability. Right. You're just going to give uh, the, the estate outright. Um, so it's important now because, you know, a lot of times old plans would just say, hey, just split everything 50 50 and let's you know, let's let's be done with it. But it's important now to realize the different tax brackets. Again, factoring in distributable net income or DNI, if all of that income from the IRA passes out to the daughter with a disability, you're looking at a 12% tax rate, which is, but the daughter without a disability, you know, she's out there working and, you know, she's in the 32% um, tax bracket. So what does that look like from a tax perspective? Well, you can see here, the, the daughter with a disability is able to stretch that IRA out for longer pay way less in taxes. So does it make sense to, and, and this particular illustration assumes no investment growth. Actually, if you factor it in, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Okay. Um, but, uh, you, you know, uh, basically the, the point here guys is, yeah, this is different. We're, we're, we're in a new sandbox now and leaving money to a person with a disability from an IRA generally from a tax perspective, now makes a lot of sense. So maybe it is time to go back and revisit that plan. Maybe it is time because obviously mom and dad's goal here was to you know, provide for their daughter with a disability for as long as possible, as well as take care of their daughter without a disability. So maybe it's better to title that IRA to um, you know, the daughter with the beneficiaries uh, special needs trust. And when you look at all the other things like cost basis, right? Step up on the uh, investments, things like that. All of a sudden, it makes a lot more sense. Um, life insurance is generally tax-free. Um, and also for the third-party pooled special needs trust, there's this thing called a QDT exemption, which could apply, okay? There, this is different for a lot of uh, people think that it just applies to any disability trust. I'm here to tell you that it doesn't, that you have to be very careful when you're drafting, but it, it can be worth it. It, it is a you know $5,000 plus exemption um, you know, uh, to offset any income within the trust, therefore offset any taxes due, any tax liability from the trust. QDT stands for Qualified Disability Trust. So you know, again, just another tax planning tool to the IRS. Uh, excuse me, to the uh, to the special needs trust. But I do want to give the IRS a lot of credit here. The IRS historically has always been very sympathetic and pro people with disabilities. Okay, ABLE accounts, that's an IRS regulation, right? It basically circumvented, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an amendment to 529, it's 529A section of the uh, IRS code that is a tax advantaged um, you know, savings plan for people with disabilities that doesn't count as a resource or income um, to people on means tested public benefits. And it kind of circumvents a lot of SSI rules about distributions for food and shelter being count potentially counted against that beneficiary's SSI, uh, you know, uh, SSI calculation and the amount that they receive. Cool news if you haven't heard this, but as of September 30th, food will no longer count as an in-kind support and maintenance item for uh, people on means-tested public benefits like SSI. That is awesome. That is a step in the in the right direction. Meaning a special needs trust can now pay for food for a beneficiary with a disability without potentially negatively affecting their SSI amount. Again, um, you know, but 
ABLE being before that, being an IRS rule, right? Grantor trust tax status for an irrevocable first party special needs trust. In other words, that those special needs trust funds that are funded with the beneficiary's money, be it from their earnings, from the sale of a home, from a personal injury or med mal settlement, those are taxed as a grantor trust, which means that they uh, that they uh, you know, all the income is 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 taxed at their potentially very low level. That's an IRS provision. And now this Secure Act 2.0 and Secure Act, you know, being very beneficial for people with disabilities. So long-winded way of, of giving props to the IRS uh, for advocating for people with disabilities. Okay. Now I want to talk very quickly about um, accelerated distributions for a minor beneficiary. So let's say, unfortunately, mom or dad pass away while this beneficiary is 17. They stick it all in the conservatorship or guardianship of the estate, depending on what state you're in. Um, the beneficiary in current tax bracket is 12%, right? Because they're not working. They're 17 years old. Um, age of majority, remember again that the IRS has defined that for us for this particular uh, stretch. So we can see here, hey, beneficiary is going to start working at age 21. We're projecting them to be in the, with the 22% tax bracket, okay? So what does that look like? If we took the RMDs only during, because remember, they get the stretch during minority. So if we just took the RMDs only, and then the 10-year rule kicks in at age 21, we will have paid about $86,000 or 21% of the original corpus of the IRA over um, you know, their lifetime, or excuse me, the lifetime of this inherited IRA. However, you can probably, whoops, already guess what I'm going to say here. If we take advantage of the fact that this beneficiary isn't working and we throw more into the conservatorship in those years where, you know, their tax bracket is low, look at that. We can save, you know, almost $12,000 in taxes for the beneficiary. So the whole point here is basically like, hey, do the cost benefit analysis. Think this stuff through. Don't just take the required minimum distribution if you don't especially if you need the money, right? If the beneficiary needed the money for additional schooling or whatever the case may be, as trustees, don't be afraid to take more than the required minimum distribution. Just make sure that you you know, you know, think it all through. And um, you can see here that there's other scenarios wherein taking the RMD may be more prudent. For example, beneficiary living in a uh, assisted living facility, uh, you know, that's being paid for by the special needs trust or whatever the case may be, you have that extra medical deduction. And so just knowing more about your beneficiaries and thinking through their tax situation can really help make their trust account last even longer. So with that, we're done. Um, I will now pull the chat over here in front of me so I can see it and see if there's any questions. Um, but I, I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank Aged for having me. And, you know, I think in this area in particular, in elder law and special needs trust planning, sometimes it feels like a somewhat thankless job or it can be difficult navigating all the rules for Social Security and Medicaid. And so what you guys do is important, is really important. Uh, you know, it, it, we're blessed, quite frankly, to be able to serve what I think is one of the most underserved, but potentially one of the most deserving populations in this country. And so thank you for all the work that you do and, and being advocates for people with disabilities. Okay, looks like we have one question from Karen here. I was told that if you have a client on his or her's deathbed, it's best to close out the IRAs before death and add it to their trust. If you, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. Here's what would happen. So let's just walk through this together. If you did that and you put everything in their revocable living trust, which is going to become irrevocable upon their death, then all of that money from the IRA is going to be taxable income to them at their, you know, in the in the, the tax year that they pass away. So I don't know the answer. It could be a good idea if they have a they have a ton of uh medical deductions in their final year or you know, things like that. But here's what I'll say. Then you've completely destroyed the tax deferred growth for any of the inheritors. It's just gone. And so if you did that, depending on the size of the IRA, right, if you're not worried about that, yeah, sure. Uh, it makes sense. And if it's a net zero uh, tax 
you know, bill do, okay, you know, I can kind of see that. But as a fiduciary, I'd be really worried that the remainder persons would come back and sue me for doing that and making that advice because you have destroyed their uh, tax deferred status for either the next 10 years or potentially over their life for the rest of the IRA. Now, again, depends on the IRA size. If it's de minimis, then sure. But I mean, that's that would be, I, I would think, you know, pretty, uh, that would be disregarding remainder persons, which is a fiduciary's duty as well, right? The fiduciary duty of loyalty and impartiality applies not only to the current beneficiary, but any remainder persons as well. Well, that was really awesome, Peter. A lot of information for us, but very helpful um, to the the planning world and to those of us that work with, uh, you know, trust and persons with disabilities. I'm actually getting ready to open a third party special needs trust where we have an inherited IRA that will be making RMDs into the trust. So this was a great um, refresher for me, and I will look forward to working with Peter on that particular trust because uh, Agent uses TrueLink for our trust software and as our financial advisors. So we have the resources like Peter and his um, other people that work with him uh, to help us through these things. And of course, the accountant, um, is always an integral part of anything that you're doing with an IRA. So don't hesitate to work with your accountants on these things also. I'm looking at the chat to see if we have any more. We have some thank yous, great presentation. And um, Agent's next webinar is... Uh, going to be the second Wednesday in June, which is June 12th. I'm sorry, in May, <laughs> May 8th. And we are going to have a CPA that does a lot of trust tax work. And she's going to help us learn a little bit more about trust taxes. So Peter talked about DNI today. I'm sure that's one thing that Carol Felsing will be talking to us about and, you know, even if you don't get everything, if you just pick up one or two things and educate yourself and hear the terms, the more you hear it, the more, more you'll understand. So I would thank everybody for attending today and look for an email from Kate with your certificate of attendance. Of course, she will be uh, submitting the guardianship um, CEs and to CE broker for you. We need to make sure we have your email if you attended the presentation. So Peter, thank you again. Really appreciate your uh, time today and I will close it out. Goodbye.